Okay, guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren. Ich mache es wie bei der SBB, damit Sie sicher sind, dass Sie am richtigen Ort sind. Wir haben heute die dritte Vorlesung der, der diesjährigen Reihe der einstein lexus Mathematik äh, gewidmet und äh, Frau Tretter wird kurz jetzt noch einmal die Referentin einführen. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Mathematical Institute and the University of Bern, I'd like to welcome you again or for the first time uh, to the Einstein Lectures 2019. Uh, and it's my pleasure to also welcome again uh, our Einstein lecturer, Professor Shafi Goldwasser, one of the most distinguished, 50 most influential, I read, computer scientists of our time. Um, it's certainly a little bit embarrassing for the speaker, but since I know that some of you are here for the first time, let me just flash through uh, the impressive number of distinctions that Shafi received. She holds actually two professorships at Weizmann and MIT, and uh, since 2018 she's director of the Simmons Institute or Simons Institute for the Theory of Computing. Uh, among the awards that she received, uh, the most notable, in particular in this week, where all these Nobel Prizes are awarded, is the ACM Turing Award, or AM Turing Award, um, which she uh, received in 2012 jointly with Silvio Mecali, because this is considered to be the Nobel Prize in computer science, which didn't exist when Nobel Prizes were uh, first awarded, obviously. Now, of the other uh, distinctions. Uh, Shafi was elected to several national academies. Uh, she was invited to a, a briefing of US Congress on cryptography and uh, she received um, several honorary doctoral degrees, so many that websites aren't keeping up with them. Uh, I, for example, discovered another one today uh, in addition to, to the one from her alma mater, Carnegie Mellon, and to the University of Oxford, I found another one in 2017 from a place I visited myself, Ben-Gurion University of the Negev, and there may be even more. So um, uh, this is really, really impressive, and we are very, very happy that you agreed to come here to Bern and to share with us your great enthusiasm and, uh, I would say, a revolutionary ideas about uh, mathematics and computer science, which inspired many people, might be a shock for some too, but that's necessary to make progress. So we are very much looking forward to your third Einstein lecture, Shafi. Please. Hello? Yeah. Okay, hi everyone, and thank you for coming again, <laughs> or coming for the first time, as Christian said. Um, so this is my uh, third lecture, and uh, the topic is cryptography for safe machine learning. I gave two talks before. The first one was uh, called, I guess, the cryptographic lens, where the focus was to give you some examples of how uh, fairly basic uh, ideas, uh, certainly were motivated by basic questions uh, in cryptography, have made an impact uh, on um, technology and uh, on some scientific disciplines. And then uh, yesterday I talked about something completely different. Uh, today I'm going back, hmm, I'm going back uh, in a sense to continue where I left off in the first lecture, and that is to talk about another area which is more a futuristic area where I think that cryptography has a room to play, and that's what I call safe machine learning. 
So again, last time I talked about electronic commerce, I talked a little bit about quantum computing, about the fact that we have to prepare for uh, an age where quantum computers may hurt the existing uh, crypto systems. Uh, I haven't talked about, micro about cryptocurrencies, I think people know about Bitcoin and so forth, but I mentioned zero knowledge proofs, which are uh, technology that can enable doing, uh, having cryptocurrencies with an on anonymity and talked a little bit about cloud computing, because remember we talked about delegating computation to the cloud, a, or an interactive proof between a, a user and a, a cloud where the cloud is doing the computation, and then it proves to the user that it did the computation correctly. And there's an asymmetry in terms of the computational power. The cloud may have lots of computing power. This user has a little bit, and he still is able to verify correctness of these uh, claims that the cloud makes about the correctness of the computation. But I really think that the next frontier of frontiers is how to enable safe machine learning. And of course, in order to do that, I need to um, explain what I mean by safe machine learning. So first of all, in terms of what machine learning is, uh, there's certainly a lot, of, um, a lot of articles people read, even in the popular press. So I just have a few um, also very general uh, slides about that. So in terms of a field, machine learning lies somewhere in the intersection of artificial intelligence, uh, statistics and theoretical computer science. So it's a field that emerged from these three different fields, or at least you, people from the th these three different disciplines, ideas from these three different disciplines play a role in machine learning. And if I had the most general way to describe it, I would say it's a field that explores the construction of algorithms that can learn from and make predictions on data without being explicitly programmed. So rather than the traditional way where you write a program um, and you might prove properties of this program like running time and correctness, here you are given data and from the data somehow in some automated fashion, you uh, come up with uh, what is called, you learn something, the machine learns from the data to uh, make uh, predictions or other things. We'll see some examples in the future. And uh, the idea is that you usually take this data and you build some uh, model from sample uh, inputs. We'll say a bit more about, the, be more concrete, but let me just say that there are many machine learning models, but regardless of what the model is, they usually are, or always are, two stages. First stage, and I'll refer to it throughout the talk, is a training phase. So phase one, what happens is you are given some training data, Training data may be examples, let's say example of a cat, that's an example that machine learning people like to use. Uh, maybe there are a lot of cat lovers or uh, there's a competition between the cat lovers and the dog lovers. In any case, training data might be a picture of a cat and then it says that it's a cat. Or that's what I mean by a label, that it's labeled as a cat or a picture of a dog labeled as a dog, a picture of an airplane labeled as an airplane and so forth. Could be also data that's unlabeled, just there's lots of data that's available and there might be some, um, clusters, there's a way to cluster this data even without labels. But there's always some training data of one form or another, and uh, often you want to assume that it's drawn from an unknown distribution. So there is some underlying distribution, we don't necessarily know what the distribution is. And in the first phase, given this data, you want to generate some sort of hypothesis, sometimes it's called a model, a, for how this, for example, in the case of label data, how is the labeling of the data done, and you test the quality of this hypothesis by comparing it against the data to see if this model is a, is a good predictor of the labels. So the data is large, obviously the model has to be sort of a, a small model that has to be consistent, or a small hypothesis, small to describe hypothesis, that has to be consistent with this data. Um, so that's phase one, and we'll call it training phase. And the reason I have this arrow on the side is because often this is, it, it's, a, it's an iterative process. You get some training data, then you get more and more and more, and you modify your hypothesis till the time that it somehow converges or, you get, or stabilizes, and that no matter how much more data you give, the model doesn't change, doesn't predict any better by looking at more data. And then people talk about accuracy of the model. It might not be 100% explaining the, the data, but it might explain it 90%, 99%. Um, so this is the general idea. The second phase of machine model, uh, machine learning, is that whatever model that you developed in the first phase is used now for the future. So for what type of tasks? 
So here are an example of three tasks. It might be used to classify new data drawn from that distribution. So in other words, if your model for some reason, um, I think what happens is it keeps, the wireless keeps turning on uh, and that disturbs, so let me just try to see how to turn this off. Turn the Wi-Fi off, okay. Uh, so you've generated a model, and now um, let's say this model classifies uh, pictures into cats, dogs, and airplanes, and now you want to come up with the, some new data and use the model to classify whether it was a picture of a cat, a dog, or an airplane. That is one task which is a classification task. Another task might be that you just want to generate new data similar to what you've seen. So in other words, you have seen lots of cats and dogs, now you want to come up with a model that what it does is generates pictures of cats, not the cats you've seen, but new cats, things that would be seen by humans and classified as cats, generate pictures of dogs, generate uh, pictures, um, you know, maybe essays, maybe generating uh, paintings, but it's a generative model rather than a classification model. Another thing might be that it just would explain the data. So it would tell you what's an average, you know, if it's a distribution, what's the average of distribution, what's the standard deviation, what are some of the moments. So these are typical tasks of a machine learning, um, a machine learning a phase two. And we will call this the classification, you can call it generation or explanation. In this talk, <clears throat> for simplicity, I will focus just on Training and classifying. So let's not talk about generation, but the same kind of treatment uh, would be useful for also talking about generation or explanation. Okay, so let's be concrete. You know, so I said that every machine learning model has these two phases. So let's take a particular example of what our problem could be. And it would be, let's say there is this box, this black box. The reason I'm calling it a black box is because you can't look inside but you, uh, you are told or you believe that there is some sort of formula in this, in this box. This formula here uses ands and ors, doesn't matter, some formula. Uh, so I call this box uh, C, so it's a formula C or concept C that takes variables x1, x2, x3 and then gives a label out. So these variables, if you like, could be pixels of an image and then the answer would be cat, dog, airplane. Or other examples might be C could be used to answer things like, is an email message a spam? So you get in an email message and then you have a determination, go to spam box, don't go to spam box. It could be an, a picture, uh, an MRI of a tumor, a suspect tumor, and it would be malignant, non-malignant. It could be, should a student be admitted to college? That would be an application. It could be, should a, la a bank loan be approved? Should a suspect be released on bail? So this is a very generic description of what it is that we're trying to do. Again, so there would be a, 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 a x1 through xn would be a vector of features, and usually we call them features of inputs, and then there will be a determination. Now, this box works in mysterious ways. Okay, you assume there is such a box, okay? You don't know, you don't have, access, you don't have a, a, a way to look at the internals of this box. Obviously, uh, it would be fantastic if you, you would, could lo love to learn this box. You would love to learn how it is that this magic box is able to make determinations of whether uh, 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 you should release someone on bail or not, and then they would not be a flight risk. Or you'd love to know how the right box should accept students to college so they would be successful, and so forth. This amorphic box that may, that, that exists. But the question of course is um, how, how, that seems quite hard uh, to learn this perfect box, and maybe the more interesting question is what is it that you know about this box? What kind of query access do you have to this box? Are you able to feed you know, pictures and get an answer? Are you able to feed a suspect, a description of a, of a suspect record and get an, a perfect answer of whether you should release them on bail or not? Or do you just get random examples of what has happened in the past? So what kind of access you have to this box, of course, determines how easy it's going to be to learn it, okay? Whether it will be possible to learn it or not. Okay, so we're all in sort of vague, vague world, uh, but that's good enough, I think, for our purposes. Um, so, still, you know, as, the, as theoreticians or mathematicians, you would love to define this uh, more exactly as a mathematical problem. 
So uh, you want to define what it means to successfully learn, what's the query model, how can you access this box. And uh, in uh, 1984, there was this very famous paper by Leslie Valiant, which was a theory of the learnable. So he came up with uh, um, essentially um, just a definition of what it means to learn uh, this box. Okay, so it's a theorist definition. And, um, and uh, this is a lot of words, let me just read them. You don't need to read them. But he says, he defines something called probabilistically and approximately correct learning. And he says, given examples, x and uh, the, the value that the, uh, the box gives on x, so labeled examples, drawn according to some unknown distribution, a successful learning algorithm generates a new hypothesis. So you start with C, you generate a new box H, if you like, a new hypothesis H, where H agrees with C approximately and with high probability on inputs from D. What does that mean? It means that if you look at uh, the number of labels on which H and C agree, okay, there is the probability that the labels disagree is small, okay? So in other words, it's, uh, a, it's possible that you disagree, but you're requiring that this is gonna happen with, uh, small, with it's an unlikely event. So this is a definition. In some sense, this definition is just putting down mathematics for what I said in words in the previous slide. And then there was, you know, this, there, were a lot, there was a lot of work, different type of concept classes, which you know if the formulas are simple, how easy or hard it is to learn, lots of papers. Uh, I think probably it was more optimistic to begin with. That there will be a lot more things which would be easy to do, but it's actually a hard task for certain, even sim simple looking uh, concepts. And uh, now, what does cryptography have to do with it? So I just want to say that historically, going back to the 80s, there was actually a relationship between cryptography and this machine learning as defined by Les Valiant. Um, maybe because, um, you know, he was at Harvard and it's close to MIT, and MIT there was Rivest Ramir and Adelman, or Rivest at least, and they were friends, and they sort of went back and forth. And the place that cryptography came in was really, in some sense, is saying, okay, it's very nice, what can we learn? What cryptography was used is to show what you cannot learn. So you, an immediate question that a complexity theorist or a cryptographer asks, is it really true that you can learn everything? Uh, are there concepts which are not learnable according to the definition of Valiant, which are not PAC learnable, probably, probably and approximately correct? And in fact, you know, very soon after, once you ask that question, and uh, Valiant and Kearns, who was at the time a graduate student of him, showed that you, there's lots of concepts you cannot learn, that are impossible to learn, okay? And the sort of more, more interesting results of this nature are under the assumption that secure RSA encryption. So I talked about encryption the first lecture, you know, this problem of communicating between two parties without ever meeting public key encryption. And what they showed is if actually you don't even need it to be public key, that if encryption of the type that I talked about exists, uh, then actually it's impossible to learn certain concepts. So what is good for one field, that is good cryptography, implies hard to learn concepts. And it's, when you think about it a little bit, it becomes kind of clear, because good cryptography means that the adversary cannot learn what you've sent. So there is some a learning problem that's implicit in good cryptography, and by showing good cryptography, you show that it's impossible to learn for the learning theorist. Great. So in some sense, we can summarize it to say that bliss for crypto is nightmare for machine learning. And interestingly, uh, there were a lot of these results, you know, showing more and more things that you couldn't do in machine learning using more and more sophisticated type of cryptography. And then there was a paper, actually, uh, that came, I think it was 93, it appeared in a cryptography conference which learning people wrote. And they said, you know, modern cryptography had considerable impact on the development of learning theory, the impact being showing the limits of what you can learn. And uh, virtually every hardness result in Valiant's model uh, comes from uh, origin, is hard in a cryptographic construction. So saying, you know what, in this paper, we're gonna give you results in the reverse direction. We're gonna show you, uh, we, what they did is they said, here's a problem that comes from learning theory. It's not a problem that you cryptographers think about. But it seems like it's hard for us, so it's not you're giving us hard problem. We are telling you, here's a natural problem that's hard for us. Maybe you can use it for cryptography. 
Okay? And in fact, that problem that they came up with is related to something I talked about in the first lecture. So the problem that came from learning theory was this problem about solving a system of equations. In, at the, from learning theory, this, the, there was this vector s, for people who remember from the first lecture, otherwise you can ignore this next two slides, I just wanted to make this connection. Um, so there is some a secret s, which is a vector s1 through sn, this time it's zero, 1. And one of the learning theories that people in learning encountered was how do you solve a system of uh, equations in these zero, 1 variables if instead of knowing the real solution, the zero, 1, zero, zero, 1, you actually took the right hand side and you flipped it 0 to 1 or 1 to 0 with some small probability. Suppose I didn't give you the equations exactly correctly, I flipped the answers on the right and I asked you to solve it now, that seems to be a very hard learning problem. And they came to cryptographers and said, hey, you can use it maybe for crypto, maybe you can embed a crypto system here and get something out of it. And in fact, it happened to be the case, uh, that I'm just jumping to the next slide, that that very problem that I showed you in the first lecture, where instead of looking at zero, 01, you're looking at numbers, and on the right-hand side there isn't zero, 01, but there are sort of numbers and you're adding Gaussian noise, is a problem that now we use in cryptography all the time. So starting from people from learning theory who had some natural question they couldn't solve, bringing it to the cryptographers and then cryptographers changing it a little bit, we actually now have this learning with error problem which I talked about in the first lecture, which we're using now as a candidate for um, a coming up with encryption schemes which are robust against quantum uh, computers. So this is in some sense uh, interesting, mostly for those who study sort of the history of science, that the fact that these two fields talk to each other has helped uh, in a kind of a strange way to come up with a, a problem that now as cryptographers we use all the time. It is a candidate to battle quantum computers. It has a lot of versatility. It allows what we call homomorphic encryption and so forth. Okay, now we move to really the topic of this lecture. So this was in the 80s. All this development of these hard problems and something that's hard for learning, is good for crypto, was in the 80s. But today, sort of in this last couple of years and going forward, which is the main topic of this lecture, we're gonna show that impossibility results are actually not negative news or nightmare for learning, but they are gonna be very positive news for machine learning of today. So somehow, whereas the past, it was sort of you show good result for one field, it's a bad result for the other. Now we're gonna show that good cryptography, so, you know, interesting cryptography is actually gonna propel machine learning forward. So why and how? So the way I wanna kind of proceed from here is um, explain to you that cryptography is really necessary for machine learning. So first observation is, I said that you know, there was the PAC model of uh, Levaliant and it was beautifully clean but hard. There are many concepts that cannot be learned. Still, we all know that machine learning is now hailed as the avenue um, for progress, right? And it seems that the difference is that we have a lot of data. The fact that there's huge amounts of data that's being collected worldwide has made it so that learning models that existed in the past, like neural nets, and so forth, where people didn't know that they are, would be successful. In fact, I think people knew about this 30 years ago, but they weren't successful. All of a sudden, with the advantage of having lots of training data, huge successes came about. And that's true you know, for health, for finance, for economic growth, for infrastructure, traffic patterns, energy usage, for vision, for natural language understanding, for threat prediction, for policing, deciding which neighborhoods to police, for bail, deciding who's a flight risk, for credit rating. All of this, uh, these are fields that people are using lots and lots of data, training data to build models, uh, hypotheses, and then they get good accuracy with respect to this data and can use it for prediction in the future, or they are using it for prediction. And um, in fact, some of these things are not just papers, but I think that in New Jersey, there is actually already in the courts, they were using algorithms uh, to decide, like in, in, in um, judges are using them at least as aids to help them decide whether to let someone out on bail or not. I think in New Orleans, there is, uh, there was a, 
there's a system that the police is using when they have to decide where to send cars to which neighborhood because they don't have enough police cars, so they want to use it wisely. And this is all based on all data of where crimes were committed, you know, who was a flight risk. But in any case, my point is of this whole slide is that all of a sudden there's a sudden shift of power. So decisions that were made by um, in different ways are now made are now made or at least aided by these automatic systems that are learning from data of the past to make predictions in the future. And uh, in fact, if you look at sort of the largest companies by market cap, you know, it used to be that in the 2000s there was were oil companies, you know, energy companies. Now they're all data companies. So if you think about sort of the who uh, the market, you know, it's uh, Amazon, uh, uh, Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, and so forth. And there's all these quotes that you can see where they say data is the new oil, data will become a currency, and so forth. So this is all very good and, and, and well. The thing is that this sudden shift of power that happened very quickly in the last couple of years in some sense, you know, does have the risk of leaving us unprotected, unregulated, and having this power at the hands of um, entities which weren't really mandated to hold all, all, all that power. And these are clear, but I'm not saying this in order to be a fear monger because there's always a risk and uh, that um, the public says, oh, this is terrible, we shouldn't do it. <laughs> um, I'm not mocking, but somewhat, because that's sort of a reaction that's immediate. So we have to wait a minute. The reason that this data, the, the reason there is this rush is because there is a lot of power in data, and one should try to think of how to use it in a positive way. And it's not so great, and the systems that we have today don't work perfectly either. So if we think about le letting people out on bail, you know, many people, at least in the United States, are incarcerated sitting, waiting for someone to make the decision if they go out on bail or not. So there is something about having an efficient system that makes decisions that has some advantage uh, to it. So. I guess what I want to say is that the new task that is ahead of us and where cryptography, in my opinion, could be of huge help is to ensure that this power of machine learning algorithms is not abused. And um, the kind of cryptography that I'll talk about, I'll mention during the talk, it's developed in the last 30, 40 years, and it concerns, it doesn't concern communication. So often people who don't do cryptography think that cryptography really is about sending secret messages or logging into computers with passwords. And that was somewhat the focus of my first lecture. But really in the last 30 years or so, the focus of cryptography has been not on secure communication, but on what we call secure computation. So we know how to encrypt, we know how to do passwords quite well. I mean, maybe it's not quantum resistance, so we're switching to quantum resistance, but we have good definitions, good techniques. But secure computation is something else. The idea here, and I will explain as I go along, is that computations on data, on input, uh, also there is some security aspect that you would want to guarantee, as we will see when we come along. While you're processing the data, this data might be left unprotected. And can you protect the data even while it's being processed? That's sort of a, a key concern when you talk about secure communication. Another concern is when you want to share data among several parties and you don't want to give away your data. Um, and a lot of work since the mid 80s has been on secure computation rather than secure communication. And all of this work is, suits very well these problems in machine learning and can go a long way to, uh, uh, toward this safe machine learning where abuse is not done or at least it's not done to the extent that it could be done. Okay? So um, the way that I want to proceed with this, I will tell you some challenges, some sort of immediate challenges that, that you need to kind of think about when you think about machine learning and tell you how cryptography for some of these challenges is very obviously useful. So the first challenge is this. If it's just a straight, clear deduction, if the power of machine learning comes from data, and the data is data about individuals, okay, or about uh, then like p how people drive, uh, what, met, what illnesses they have, how, what energy use they make, and what relationships they have. If this is what enables uh, the power, then we want to make sure, and we don't want this power to be abused, we want to ensure privacy of both the data and the model that's being learned from the data so we can maintain this power at the hands of those who generated it, the data and also, Maybe it's not just a question of privacy, it's also a question of value. 
So in other words, if my data, why shouldn't I have the say in terms of who monetizes it? And why shouldn't I be able to monetize it myself? So um, there are sort of three places that are sort of clear where privacy concerns come up. During the training phase, where you are taking data and using it to train the algorithm. Remember I said there was training and classifying. During the classifying phase. And even later, after you've already have a model, uh, you might not want this model to be stolen by someone. Why? Uh, well, first of all, maybe you've put a lot of effort into building the model, but also sometimes you can actually, just by looking at the model, even though it's a succinct des description of the data that you saw, you can use it to reverse engineer and find the data that that model was trained on. So these are sort of three clear places where privacy can be lost and people are addressing how you can do machine learning, how you can do training and classifying a, and using a, a model without losing this privacy. So in particular, how are we gonna do that? Well, we're gonna do that, uh, obviously new ideas come up all the time, but there, there is 30, 40 years of cryptography, and a lot of what's being done in the field now is sort of taking these toolbox that's out there and trying to see which tool fits which problem. So here there's a lot of tools. Uh, I will talk about each one of them it, it, during the slides. So just sort of a, a laundry list um, or Chinese menu. So there's something called multi-party computation, and this is a tool that enables different data centers that have different data to talk to each other and compute together some outcome uh, of, that's defined as a result of all of the data without giving it to each other. Uh, homomorphic encryption is something I talked about the first time. The letters have gotten confused here. It's a way to encrypt data and then still while it's encrypted to do evaluation on it without decrypting it and then give back the decrypted result. There's something called secret sharing, which is kind of an interesting magical tool where you can take a piece of in, uh, information that you really want to keep secret and instead of uh, storing it somewhere because you're afraid that maybe somebody's going to break into this place you store it, you can sort of break it into pieces. Think about a puzzle where you break it into puzzle pieces. You store each puzzle piece in a different computer and you do this mathematically, of course, with the guarantee that if unless they see most of the puzzle pieces, you're not going to be able to put it together or find anything about the puzzle. So this is a way to share a secret so that it attacks on individual pieces don't yield the entire secret. Uh, that's another method that's useful in this field. Another type of method is uh, something called garbled circuits, and that is if I have a program to a way to somehow rewrite that program in kind of a garbled fashion so that even though you can run the program, you can't tell really how the program works. Again, one of these uh, use, uses without looking inside. And there's something called differential privacy, which is yet another field which sort of tells you how to um, take data and modify it by adding noise to it so that you can't really recover what the original data is or even know whether a particular piece of data participated or not, but you can still get statistical signal out of the data. So you've added small enough noise, so still it's true that if you have a lot of data, each with small noise, and overall you can learn something from the data, but you haven't learned about particular data entries. All right, so these are gonna be all the methods. And now let's say specifically how one, each such method, I'm not gonna use all of them, is used. All right, so let's go back to this uh, idea that we have training, and classify. And here I, I wrote some schematic where it shows who the, what the stages are. So there's a training phase, and let's say this has happened, this Google's training or Apple or some large server. They have training data, and then they work on it, and they come up with a model. So this is one phase. And another phase is the classification phase, where the model's already created, and now you have, in some sense, a game between the server that has the model, the prediction model, say, for cats and dogs and so forth, and now there's a piece of data. Might be a particular picture or a particular MRI. And what is happening during the classification phase, this client gives the data, the server comes with the model, and at the end, the prediction hands, uh, lands at the ha hands of the client, okay? So this is kind of the schematic of what goes on. And the privacy question, 
are two separate privacy questions. So one, in the, in the, in the time of training, often this data is sensitive and valuable. So if we go back to the medical examples, it could be immunization record, medication, allergies, genomic data. And this is something that maybe by regulation, by uh, desire, you want to keep secret. You might even want to keep secret from the, from the company who, like Google, who's building the training model. But that's not the only entity you'd want to keep secret from. But also, often, this data comes from multiple sources. It's not one place that's giving Google the data. There's lots of sources. An example that people often talk about is on Apple. You know, that when you type text, they kind of predict what the rest is. It's extremely annoying, because sometimes they predict it incorrectly. Uh, but how do they come up with this prediction model? So apparently, they use a lot of uh, typed um, queries, um, requests of many users, and they build a model of what is uh, what is likely to be the next word in your sentence. And these models are also personalized, but they need data from many sources. So what you want is to make sure that while you're going and giving this training data, that these sources uh, don't necessarily tell each other their data. So there's, you know, you have to think about it, but there's two problems here. One is that you don't want necessarily the, the, the server to learn the data, and two is that maybe uh, you don't want to tell each other what your data is, if there's many entities who combine data together. Uh, so uh, what's useful for it? So for the problem of combining data that comes from different sources, there is this secure multi-party computation with this picture. And what we know is still even from the 80s that there's so sort of this universal theorem, I'll call it, which says that these trustful parties, these people really may not trust each other at all to keep privacy can compute any program F on the data via distributed protocol. When I say distributed protocol, I'm saying they do computation locally, they send messages to all the neighbors, they get responses, they do more computation, they go in phases, and at the end they say, okay, we have the answer. Um, and they, at the end you reveal the result and nothing but the result. There are some conditions on these, whether this is possible, you need encryption, for example, uh, to exist. Sometimes you need, depending on uh, the setting, you say maybe there's no encryption, but I know that a majority of these people uh, is honest. And under this uh, assumption that there's less than a majority bad guys, you can uh, compute the function without telling each other the data. And uh, in fact, it's made so much headway that even there is a, a congressional bill in the US Congress which talks about this, and it says uh, the term secure multi-party computation means a computerized system that enables different participating entities in possession of a private sets of data to link and aggregate their data sets for exclusive purpose of performing a finite number of pre-approved computation without transferring or otherwise revealing any private data to each other or anyone else. So that's in English really what the definition would be. It's actually remarkably accurate. Um, and not only that you can define it, as I said, you can actually use mathematics to achieve it. And I won't, of course, tell you how, but the basic idea is uh, really from using sort of arithmetic on polynomials. So uh, here's one way to think about it. Suppose I have a polynomial and um, I can, first of all, the, the point is that I can take a program and compute it to, uh, a, a, to, a, 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 I can take a program and transform it to the following. I can think of the inputs of the program as variables, and, I can, and then I can uh, take those inputs. Let's say I'm, I have data and I want to do a distributed protocol with you. I don't want to give you my data. So what I do is I define a polynomial where if you, there was enough interpolation points on this polynomial, you could reconstruct my data. But I give each one of you a different interpolation point. If all of you get together, you can reconstruct the polynomial, figure out my data. But if enough of you don't get together, then my data is still, you know, all polynomials are li likely and equally likely, and you don't know what my data is. And then you can think of the steps of the program as operations on summing or multiplying a, essentially polynomials. And people can sort of do summing and multiplication of polynomials by working with their interpolation points rather than with the entire symbolic polynomial. So um, this is just for the mathematicians in the audience, just to give you a hint that there is actually something behind this, that it is possible to do it. So uh, 
At the end, the op all of the parties who proceed doing this kind of recipe will hold essentially uh, interpolation points on a polynomial who, who, that if you could reconstruct it, you would have the output of the result. Okay, so let's go back to privacy, to the general picture. So this is during the time of training. And this is how many parties can combine together uh, their inputs and a, en enable a server to learn a model. In fact, in, in, I know that in Google there's a whole, uh, pro, a whole um, a division that works on something called federated learning. And federated learning is essentially these multi-party computation with a new word. And without using this type of mathematics, but using a sort of more dumbed down version because their requirements are not as strong as what you can achieve really in theory. So the other part is what happens during the classification stage. So now the model has been trained already. You've got a succinct, beautiful model that can predict cats. Um, and the thing is, somebody has really their favorite cat, or maybe their MRI, and they don't want to share their MRI with necessarily the company that's built the model, but they want to use the services. So how could you do that? How do you uh, go through a classification stage where the server keeps his model private and the client keeps his data private. So this is, uh, there are two, uh, two concerns here. The server doesn't want to give the model. The client doesn't want to give the data. And you want to achieve both of them getting correct predictions. And the idea here is that, um, so again, for an example, it might be a hospital uh, that has lots of, a, a great model, and then there's a doctor who might be a rural doctor who wants to use these services of the hospital and send over the MRI uh, uh, results or the medical records. And uh, this is almost by definition what we call a two-party protocol. There are two parties here, the server, the client, and they want to do a two-party computation, like in that picture with lots of data servers. There's just two where they both have data. If you can think of the model itself, it's also data. It's, it describes the model, and they go through a two-party computation. And there are results even from the 80s by Andrew Yao on how to do this. The thing is that it's not that we've froze since 1986. Sometimes you wish you froze since 1986. But in any case, uh, there has been a lot of research since on this creature, which I mentioned in the first lecture, called homomorphic encryption, which is this way, you know, started in 2008 by Gentry, lots of other papers. One of the best systems is by Brakersky, uh, Gentry, and Vikant and Nathan, and Brakersky and Vikant and Nathan are students of mine. One sits in Weizmann, one sits at MIT, now they're faculty members. Uh, where it's possible now to encrypt data in such a way that the, on the other side here, uh, if the, you think about these as two parties, this might be the hospital, which is, I drew as a cloud, and this might be the client, which is the doctor with the MRI. It's possible for the doctor just to encrypt the data and the hospital to run the machine learning model, which is just a program on that data, without decrypting. So what he returns then is the encrypted prediction of the model. So this is right exactly what you wanted. You encrypt the data, and the other side runs the model on that encrypted data and returns you the encrypted prediction. And since you know how to encrypt, it's your key, you knew how to encrypt the data, now you know how to decrypt the prediction. And uh, it's pretty remarkable that can be done. Of course, in practice, it means that you have to look at particular type of programs that do prediction. You have to look at particular ways of representing data. You have to make sure that your encryption does this efficiently. So there's a lot of data structures, how to represent, how to process, how to batch these things. You know, there's a lot of questions of bandwidth and so forth. But it's already an engineering problem. Not to make light of engineering problems. Without doing these engineering problems correctly, nobody's ever going to use this. Did you describe to me that Einstein had a patent, or someone here, on refrigerators. So this idea of cooling we existed, but the idea of actually using it for something that we all use today is remarkable. But apparently he sold the patent. Um, economically, yeah. economically for him. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, maybe that's another requirement of basic research that you actually make zero money. In that case, I'm really, hopefully that I, because of this startup that I have that I won't share in that fate, but uh, so far. <laughs> Anyway, um, okay, so there have been a huge development since 2008 uh, in this field, uh, both in speed, even in deployment, 
you can do things called multi-key homomorphic encryption, and that is it's not just one client, could be lots of clients, each one encrypting data in a different way, and yet the cloud can compute a uh, program on all of these different encryptions and re return a result, encrypted result, so that it, if they collaborate through a multi-party computation, they can figure out the prediction. Okay, so this is really, there's a group here, I know that works with uh, Christian Kaishin, <laughs> that does uh, cryptography. So just for you, or anybody else who wants to listen, so there are these two technologies. There's these multi-party computations, there is this encry uh, encrypted uh, homomorphic encryption, and is, these are two technologies that solve the same problem. When I say technologies, I mean two theories, two bodies of papers that solve the same problem. And they each have uh, advantages and disadvantages. One of them is more efficient computationally, so it's faster, but requires a lot of communication. And one of them is opa, a less efficient, a, so high computation cost, but efficient in terms of communication. So the amount of bits that you have to send from uh, the encryptor to the, let's say from the data owner to the server a, and back is small. So you have these two different technologies. One of them uses sort of Boolean circuits as their native model. One of them uses arithmetic computations. This one is very linear algebra friendly. So if you're working in the space of machine learning where a lot of linear algebra is used, then it might be the, the thing of choice. So this is just to say that this is kind of a whole field where you could debate which mathematics to use in order to solve this problem. But the basic problem is the same. Um, all right. Okay, so I want to say that uh, when people talk about machine learning, uh, there's lots of models, right? You could even talk about uh, least square regression or, 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 or logistic regression or any kind of regression model. That's machine learning. Uh, but these days, people talk about these uh, deep neural nets. Okay, so what's a deep neural net? So this is a dog, as you can tell, kind of an angry dog, uh, or at least a dog that has to go to the dentist. I have a toothache, I think maybe that's why I chose it. But in any case, um, a, so what do these networks look like? So these networks look like this. This is an input. So if it's a dog, it's the pixels that describe this dog picture. And then, uh, what ha so these are the inputs. And then there, is this fa there are these phases, and they're called deep because the number of levels, as it grows, it becomes deeper and deeper. And what these, um, what these, uh, what happens on these lines is that you essentially have uh, some weights and you take, a, uh, and these are random weights, and you take some random linear combination of the inputs and at some point you have a result and what happens in these yellow circles is that there is some sort of activation function that tells you sort of if the result is bigger or smaller than some value, then you decide, let's say, either zero or one. Usually it's real numbers, but um, that come in and you do some calculation on them and then decide what's the in, what, what comes out of these yellow circles with input to the next stage. So this is just dumbing down to you that what these operations really are. They are um, linear uh, combinations uh, where the coefficients are random weights and then you get some value and you ask is this value big or small and so forth. And this uh, big or small is not just, you know, how you make sure that whether you've determined whether something is big or small is usually called an activation function. And these are, um, you know, often logistic functions, a, a tan H function and so forth. So these are, you know, the, you want some properties from these functions, which is nice. And the truth is that as far as I can tell, people have experimented with different activation functions and they saw that some of them are come up with networks that have better accuracy in prediction let's say for cats and dogs, some of them have less, and this is how they've decided which activation function to use. So this is what the model looks like, okay? This has no cryptography in it. But what does it mean for cryptography? For cryptography, let's say, in the time of classification, what it would mean is this, is that the dog is encrypted. So these images is an encrypted, is gonna be given to this uh, network as an encrypted uh, image, and so this is to protect the client, the dog, uh, the one who has pictures of the dog, but also the weights here, or you know, all, all the values on these wires are also encrypted in some sense because this is to protect the model. And uh, if you would think about what I said before, how does this whole thing come about using the methods from before with respect to this kind of computational model? 
And have people tried to do it, or is it just in, on, in paper? So there are some two, at this point there's a lot more work, but the first two works, as far as I know, was one of them was by a group in Microsoft in 2016, which they used homomorphic encryption based on lattices in a paper called CryptoNets. And their idea was, they said, well, to actually use cryptography as is on this problem is gonna to be too slow because cryptography usually uses um, you know, bits and, dis and, and doesn't use real numbers, and these neural nets, they work with real numbers, and accuracy is a, is a real problem. So what they're saying is, let's convert you know, real numbers, sort of fixed precision real numbers to integers, because this is what we know how to work with, uh, in a, with encryption methods. And then they say these activation functions, you know, those functions that ma made the decision, again, those are functions which are hard to uh, implement on encryption because I, I, my inputs are now encrypted, so they said, let's take a different function, which also determines bigger or smaller than zero, but it's not the ones that are achieved great accuracy with respect to the machine learning, but it will be good enough. So my point being that there's sort of two new ideas, and one is if you want to do it securely, if you want to do it with the data being encrypted, then maybe you're going to have to sacrifice some accuracy if you want to do it efficiently. So there is some sacrifice, let's say, from 97% accuracy on a set of images, you would go down to 90% accuracy if you want to provide privacy. So there's some cost to it. It's not necessarily inherent. Maybe it's possible to meet accuracy and still do encryption quick. But right now, the state of affairs is that you have to sacrifice. So I was told I speak too fast. <laughs> All right, so I'll slow down. So trading accuracy, um, is one, a, one thing in order to get privacy. And the other big idea is, you know, or big challenge is, maybe one, when you're developing machine learning models, as a machine learning person, uh, you should think about how to develop cryptographic friendly models. So in other words, to begin with, as you're developing your model, you say to yourself, there are certain operations which are more friendly to cryptography, in the sense that if I wanted to use it on encrypted data, uh, these operations would be much better um, can I build my machine learning models using these type of uh, primitives? And I, you know, I don't see uh, 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 outset, in the outset why not. But I don't, uh, there was a semester in um, Simon's, uh, Simon's summer semester on the theory of deep learning. There were really people, I think the biggest experts in the field, and um, they were talking about all kinds of concerns in machine learning. I gave a talk toward the end of the semester about this, and surprisingly this is not something that is necessarily that they necessarily think about. Because, you know, we're all specialists, right? You want to do the best accuracy. Uh, you think it's, if there's some combination of people who understand both fields, it could be of great benefit. In any case, so there was a, a paper that used homomorphic encryption to do neural nets uh, with privacy. There was a paper that used multi-party computation called Deep Secure, which used, I think it's from Visa maybe, um, and they used, maybe not, I think so, uh, from a research lab. And they used uh, this multi-party computation a technology. Uh, and in both of them, they sort of did this trading accuracy for efficiency uh, step. But you can ask yourself, when is it, you know, this is, seems very ad hocish. When is it, can you sort of have it, have a, it almost engineering to tells you which crypto primitive to use uh, for, for what problem, and there's sort of a rule of thumb which says that if the computation is lin linear, okay, and uh, the compute, uh, uh, this is the time, and the circuit size is super linear, then uh, fully homomorphic encryption would be better than multi-party computation, it doesn't matter, it's already kind of for the specialist. So there are some reasons why you would use one versus the other, and in fact, there's a new paper out from 2018 which shows how to use both. Maybe you can sort of combine both methods, and in fact, that's what they show how to do. They say there are these, net, there are these layers of network, and their advice is to use uh, fully homomorphic encryption on the linear layer, and then two-party computation on the nonlinear layer, where these activation functions. In any case, so there is something to study here, how to use these methods in combination, how to change the methods to enable private machine learning. Okay, now another thing is, since this is always very new, okay, and there's the theory, you know, let's say that started with homomorphic encryption in 2008. Then people were writing papers, and it's just 2018, it's 10 years. Then there is the machine learning that's progressing at the same time. 
then you want to figure out which theory to use for machine learning. How quickly can this move? You know, how much time does this take? So the answer really is that, actually I want uh, to have this slide before the next. The answer kind of really rapidly changes. So whereas a year ago I would say there's, you know, it starts with feasibility, which is sort of that there is a theoretical paper. Then there are papers who talk about the concrete efficiency, so they write down, num you know, exactly how much it would take. And then there is actually building it, which apparently is much different than writing a paper about it. And there's a lot of proofs of concept. So a proof of concept could be graduate students writing a system, could be a, laborator a research laboratory coming up with a system and publishing it as a part of a paper in a conference, giving some graphs. Uh, but if you really want to deploy it in a real world in applications, it's, it's more than a proof of concept. And in fact, um, even that is happening. So I think today, you know, last five years, there's also libraries, sort of libraries that you can go online and find out how to use homomorphic encryption. And uh, there's more than one library. The first one was a library developed by people in IBM. Now, then there's this, uh, a library developed by some people in Korea, which is very interesting because what they've done is that they have uh, really uh, taken this idea of sacrificing accuracy for efficiency, uh, sort of much bigger, much bigger step than others. And they've used their knowledge of, of analysis, even though I think a lot more can be done, in order to be able to come up with approximations of these activation functions, which are friendly to cryptography. And then there's a library that we in our startup use is Dualisaid, uh, the soft, uh, Microsoft is very active. So these days there's actually a lot of work out there in the systems world trying to build these things because the recognition is that you want to do machine learning and you have to keep privacy. Okay, so now I told you about privacy during classification, training, I didn't talk about model stealing, you know, that would be if you invite me for some other lectures. Um, if you can talk next time, right? Uh, but instead, I want to continue with the challenges. So this was the challenge of privacy, how to do machine learning, training, classification, while keeping privacy. But privacy is not the only concern. So what are other concerns? So another concern is, okay, now let's say that you've trained the model, keeping privacy, that you know how to classify, keeping privacy. What about tampering? So what do I mean by that? You know, if these models are so important, you know, they were going to decide bail. They're going to decide if you're going to get credit, score, credit for a bank. They're going to decide if you are going to get a medical treatment or not because whether the tu tumor is malignant or not malignant, okay? Then there's also big potential for tampering, maybe for introducing, for control, for profit, for bias. Who knows, okay? I mean, in some sense, it's a big tool and it's out there. Then you could imagine there also be bad actors. So what would you like to make sure is to, to come up with methods to minimize the influence, let's say, of training data that someone may have provided, just having in mind with the idea that they want in the future to make profit. And there is work in optimization theory. How to make sure that the training data, to minimize risk uh, of the training data. From cryptography, you know, a thing you might want to do is, let's say now that a model has been developed and the company uh, that uh, you hired to develop this model, the hospital claims that this model is consistent with their data. Is there any way to check it when, when it goes out into the world? Can you actually prove to the client that this that model is consistent with the data that exists? And can you do it to a client that doesn't possess the same amount of computing power you have, doesn't have access to data like you have, maybe can only sample random data, maybe has access to lower quality data? So if we go back to this idea of proofs, you know, where there's a powerful uh, entity which might be, have access to a lot of data, a lot of computation, there's a weak entity who wants to check that this model actually is consistent. And when we say check, I mean if it isn't, they will catch with high probability. So it's again the same kind of paradigm that I talked about yesterday and the day before, where you have an interaction possibly. What's different here is that the input now might be uh, data samples. It's not, you know, just a graph or a, a formula but it might be samples of a distribution, and you want to prove consistency of a model, let's say, with uh, data. Uh, and finally, the last thing for systems people, obviously you need to develop secure infrastructures to run these models, because if they're gonna run on insecure infrastructures, then all this mathematics is very nice, but then something completely different can happen. So there are new methods that have been developed. Uh, there's a field called robust statistics that deals with this 
minimizing the influence of maliciously chosen data. So saying statistics assume you can sample random samples from a distribution. But what if some of the samples are uh, corrupted? How do you make, come up with robust statistics, methods that are robust to it? Um, there is, uh, so it's not a new field, but it's, uh, I think there's novel results when you talk about data of higher dimension. Uh, so if you think about it, uh, if you have a bunch of data items, you know, and you want to compute the median of it, then median is very sensitive to somebody changing data, right? But then you could take the mean, it's less sensitive. But if you're doing this for higher dimension data, this is a harder problem and there's a lot of new methods for it. Uh, and then there's also new interactive proofs for the statistical analysis, which is exactly what I said. The verifiers might have just few samples and they still want to check consistency of the models. And sometimes these verifiers, this is some work I'm engaged in with my students, sometimes these verifiers are very simple and you could even imagine that they would be, uh, a, bit, would be a way to check models using hardware. Um, anyway, this is sort of futuristic research or current research. What's another challenge? So I think this also is linked to GDPR, which is, comes from Europe. So suppose a large company uh, is supposed to you not use your data, is supposed to sort of um, take your data and um, they can use it, but they are supposed to make sure that nobody can trace the fact that they used your data. So that's part of the GDPR uh, requirement. So the requirements are stated in English. It's kind of hard to understand exactly what mathematically they require, but you could try to define it. But in any case, what if they don't follow? How, they claim they follow. How, uh, how can you tell? Uh, do you need a major fiasco, you know, in order to be able to tell? Uh, so this is a very interesting question. How can you trace the unauthorized use of your data and model? So this is just this rule in California, which is a similar rule, maybe even stronger than GDPR. It's called digital privacy law, granting consumers more control over and insight into the spread of their personal information online. So, uh, for example, I think that this law says also that you have um, the right to be forgotten. So say you gave your data and now you say, no, I don't want to, I want to, to erase it, I want to take it back, that you have the right to do so. It's a very interesting question. How do you do it, for one thing? What if this data has been given to other agencies? Well, there are methods that could guarantee it, but of course they would slow everything down. Still, they exist. And what interested me here in this slide is how do you check they did it? Suppose they claim they use the methods that exist. How do you actually verify that? So this is what I want here with this tracing. Uh, I want to develop methods that trace training data used for learning model unless you use some privacy preserving mechanism. So you sort of want an if and only if. If they use the privacy preserving method, then you cannot find people's information. But if they didn't, then you can trace it. You can sort of catch them. So you want sort of to embed some kind of way to catch someone if they don't use privacy preserving. Again, this is work in progress, but the goal I think should be clear. You know, how do you embed some kind of thing into your training data so that later, if people did not anonymize your data or make it noisy, you could, by using, let's say, the model in a clever way, rediscover uh, this thing you have embedded, and this is kind of a proof that they didn't do what they were supposed to do. Sometimes it's called watermarking. You know, you could sort of watermark possibly the data so that later. Uh, you could find the watermark and therefore they didn't process the data the way they should have. What's another challenge? Another challenge is uh, uh, a lot of these systems, uh, especially these um, um, neural nets with the angry dog, um, in, in, in general learning, uh, machine learning, they use randomness. The reason they use randomness is because in some sense, you know, they say there is, we're, we're trying to find uh, some global minima or the, the best machine model, uh, and we're somewhat groping in the dark, we'll start from a random points, then we use something called gradient descent, whatever, and it will converge to the, to the right solution. But randomness is very important. So the question is, where is this randomness coming from? It seems to be key, but the assumption is that ra you use perfect randomness. Again, what type of randomness is good enough? Uh, it, does this randomness have to be secret? Does it have to be unpredictable? Does it ha we have to make sure that it's really non-manipulative? Uh, how is it generated? So these are questions, in some sense, I, I understood that the last talk can be more futuristic. These are kind of open questions, but they're not open questions of the sort that you can't solve them. You know, if you're young and you've got the energy and you're hungry, 
Um, I think these are the type of problems that are beautiful problems that can be approached. I don't mean hungry for food. Um, OK, what's another challenge? Uh, the other challenge I said already, define specialized cryptographic functions, which are sort of machine learning complete. So if you could do them prop quickly, then you could solve machine learning problems quickly with privacy. Um, and um, I decided that today I'm going to finish early, in contrast with the previous times. So um, I think that one should think about these machine learning challenges as opportunities. The opportunities for using uh, essentially what we've developed for 30 years. There are opportunities uh, for things that we did them, we developed them in theory, really because of kind of basic interest to use them in practice. A, and for developing new theory, I think, uh, both for cryptography and for machine learning. And my last thing is to say is that I am the director of the Simons Institute at Berkeley. And we are dedicating a lot of effort to this direction, both to machine learning and to privacy. These are sort of different threads. And we have three semesters. This already happened, data privacy. Uh, this one is, coming, is happening right now, is um, really have to do with blockchains. And this is next semester. Uh, it's going to be how to use integer lattices uh, to come up with applications of cryptography and algorithms to uh, solve lattice problems. So those of you who are interested, they should, should write to me or look at the website and, and come to the workshops. Thank you.